Hi, Vikas. Thank you for talking to us. My pleasure. Uh, my first question is on budget and uh, uh, RBI interest rates. Now, these two big events are out of the picture. Um, any specific sectors that are looking good for, like, let's say, medium term and long term perspective? You see, I, uh, for the longest period of time, I tried to have a very direct correlation between long term growth, budget, and you know what the RBI does. Uh, but I think it is good only for short to medium term. On a longer term basis, you have to identify themes, structures, uh, structural growth stories, which where you are going to make money. Now, if you look at uh, the fact that India has recently crossed $2,000 per capita GDP and there are several tailwinds which are supporting India growth, I think one should look at stocks primarily in these four, you know, we, look, we call them four by four multiplier themes. Uh, financial in inclusiveness, uh, we're talking about exports, we're talking about consumer demand uh, and we're talking about digital as a okay. segment. Uh, financial because, you're, uh, I mean, if you look at the way China grew from 2006 to 2000. 19 or 20 at that data which is available a uh, phenomenal portion of their gdp is now coming in from uh, financial services and in i think uh, 1996 china had one bank in the top 10 today there are four the top four banks are chinese yeah so if that is something which can manifest into india you're talking about an exclusive growth uh, then you're talking about consumer demand i think already uh, because of the per capita gdp uh, kicking in at this point of $2,000, people are spending less on basic amenities and more on consumption. So that is something which is set to explode. Right. Uh, you're talking about exports. We've always been known for our IT prowess, you know, outsourcing people outsource IT to us. Uh, pharma, it's mm -hmm. now chemicals. And I think these policies which the government is now talking about is making this a more structural sort of an opportunity across sectors. Mm -hmm. Last but not the least, I think uh, one of the things which is of great interest uh, to us is the fact that a lot of these large companies, you know, which are very mm -hmm. strong definitive modes, how they are evolving all over again. And they are using digital technology, what we call as digital right now, mm -hmm. in terms of expanding their mode and actually retaining their dominance. So I think investors would do well to identify companies in these good companies, high quality companies, not get carried away by, you know, uh, short term gyrations, look at high, high cash flow generating companies, high ROC generating companies and just stay the course. And that is the way to write the India story. Right. So you talked about the points which will take India uh, on the path to becoming a superpower. Yes. Uh, let's talk about risks and threats to this, uh, like this growth. You cannot wish away the fact that there will be risks. Uh, let's talk about uh, the US when it grew to becoming a superpower from 1950 onwards, when they crossed per capita GDP, or you talk about China. Mm -hmm. I think there will always be risks. Uh, we live in an increasingly interconnected world and uh, there will be geopolitical risk, there will mm -hmm. be local risk. We are a democracy at the end of the day. Right. So there will be risks emanating from within the country itself. But I think one thing which has always been India's forte is adapting itself. I mean, you can just take, for example, COVID. COVID was a global risk, not necessarily a risk to India. But I think the way we adapted to handling COVID, mm -hmm. right from creating vaccines to creating vaccination certificates, right. that itself set the pace uh, for a lot of things. So uh, there will be short term uh, issues, there could be geopolitical issues, there could be issues which will emanate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have an implosion in a particular sector or two. But I would want to think that it is happening because there is momentum. See, when there is momentum, there is going to be friction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when the wheel hits the, the rubber hits the road, there will, be there will be friction. If you don't mm -hmm. want that, then you don't move at all. But the key thing is to keep moving forward. And from that point of view, one should just appreciate, take these risks on board and learn from them. So that they don't happen again when you're at a much larger scale. Right, right. So now here we are uh, at the Dubai Alternative Investment Summit and we are pitching India to global investors, NRIs including, as a preferred investment uh, destination. Uh, recently we had Hindenburg report and then we had um, Joe Soros coming out with a statement. Do you think these events can impact India's appeal in any way? So let me just talk about the first part that we are. Uh, uh, pitching India to the world. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that pitching was happening for the last 20 years. Now we are showcasing India to the world. I think there are a lot of strengths which India has shown. Mm -hmm. And now the world is looking at us very uh, carefully. So that is one part of it. Mm -hmm. The second part of it, which in terms of uh, the events which you mentioned, I think uh, I told you this is a democracy. Uh, we we have to play, uh, place a very high amount of importance on corporate governance, mm -hmm. okay, which is increasingly something which Indian corporates are realizing. Uh, you will have incidents like these once in a while. And I'm not saying this is because of corporate governance or not. I'm not getting into mm -hmm. that. But I'm saying when you are getting globally connected, you will have you know, global entities looking at you from a very different prism. 
you know they will look at you they will talk about you they will want you and i would look at it as a positive you know if somebody is highlighting something which you need to improve on take that on board and start improving it you know look at esg for example mm -hmm. yeah uh, the world talked about esg india has gone ahead and started investing and started reaping the benefits of alternative energy correct right. this is what we learn from the world if you look at any other third world country uh, normally you talk about a lot of uh, emissions and a lot of uh, you know uh, issues which are created mm -hmm. because they're growing uh, not necessarily India. So I'm saying these are good things. Right. Uh, when you have the world looking at you from a very different lens, you just learn from them and move on. This will not stop. It does mm -hmm. not stop globally. Why should it stop here? Right. It, it's not an isolated instance, right? There mm -hmm. have been companies across the globe. The largest democracy, or rather the largest uh, country in the world, US, has had far more severe uh, issues mm -hmm. uh, there. So you have to take it on in your stride. I don't think that's an issue. Uh, talking about your fund, you are focused on mid caps and small caps. Uh, any pocket specific here uh, which are looking interesting? So, uh, it's not just mid caps and small caps. I mm -hmm. think we've got a very vibrant portfolio uh, of large and mid caps, mid and small caps, uh, you know, across the cap curve. Right. Our focus is is basically to get the best company at the best valuation. It's, it's, it's something which everybody talks about. But I've had enough discussions with my fund managers at times when we talk about a company which is doing very well but not at the right valuation. So, we will not pick it up. Okay. Likewise, when the company is not doing as well and it's a leap of faith, mm -hmm. you know, you have past markers talking about the company doing well and coming out of such situations is when we will go and buy it opportunistically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at this point of time, I think there are opportunities which are slowly starting to come in. The markets are starting to uh, rationalize, if you will, uh, which is giving us opportunities across small and mid cap. Right now, I think uh, mid and small cap is still a little frothy. Okay. okay. Uh, we will have to just wait and watch. But we are taking our time. We are picking and choosing what we want. There are some amazing new companies which are coming in. Uh, we are adding them as well. Okay. Uh, but at this point of time, one would be a little bit circumspect. Okay. Uh, any specific view on financials? We have, the, I mean, in the past, uh, it underperformed. It came back strongly last year. And if you look at last three months around, it is sort of like underperforming again. So has the rally like done in that uh, segment or there's some steam left? It's a very interesting question because when you talk about financial, it's a broad sweeping statement. Right. Today, financial consists of public sector banks, private sector mm -hmm. banks, insurance companies, mutual funds, MFIs. Uh, you've got aggregators. Uh, which portion are we talking about when we talk about? Let's talk about. Rate? Let's talk about banks. So the theme. Uh, I think uh, banks are basically a play on the Indian economy. Mm -hmm. If the Indian economy is going to grow. Uh, companies, individuals will require a lot of credit. Companies will require credit to grow. Mm -hmm. Individuals will require credit to consume. Banks today are very well placed to mm -hmm. get across and cater to them. In fact, one of the more amazing things which I'm seeing in banks is uh, that they're increasingly, I mean, they have been doing it, but now they're increasingly open about it, about using analytics mm -hmm. in terms of uh, acquiring and maintaining customers. You know, we talk about fintech firms and the valuation you give them in terms of analytics. I think in each of these large private sector banks, you have five or six fintechs clubbed into one particular uh, domain. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I just talked to you about China, uh, how the top four banks in the world right. are uh, in China today, from China today. So I'm saying if you're talking about a structural growth story coming in, banking as a sector has to grow. And this is going to be increasingly global, not, not just going to be local. Okay. Got it. Uh, one word on the overall PMS industry. I mean, uh, it has been like pitched the uh, PMS industry, somewhere there is a unique style of investing which can be like uh, tailored to an investor. Uh, it can give higher alpha. Uh, but if you look at the past performance over five, seven years, overall, if we, if we talk about not uh, focusing on any particular uh, PMS, the, there has been an underperformance. So when it comes to PS, PMS, uh, what is the time period that an investor should look at for outperformance? So there are three parts to it. Number one is, uh, what is the risk profile of the investor? The risk profile of the investor is a savvy guy who comes into this knowing fully well that he's getting into a portfolio of concentrated stocks. Mm. Okay, 15, 20, 25 stocks. These are going to be very aggressive bets. So what he should be looking at is more of absolute return rather than benchmark return. Okay, you have to show it from a benchmark basis because that is the norm. But at the end of the day, he will make money only uh, if he looks at the absolute return which he makes over a period of time. Right. So I think the risk profile of the investor is very different. Okay. Number two is uh, there is an overwhelming sort of, uh, okay, let me just correct myself. 
I think if you look at portfolio management as an entity, mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotional engagement the client has to this particular uh, uh, to this particular investment avenue. Unlike mutual fund in AFs, here there's a DMAT account which is opened in his name. There's trading which is happening in his name. So each stock which is bought and sold, okay, he gets a message. He gets to understand. So his ability to uh, respect and understand and know more is far higher mm -hmm. because his emotional engagement is very high. It's not that. The fund manager has bought for him. It is that I own this stock. You know, a lot of discussion when I have with investors, they don't say you bought this. Say so it is in my portfolio. You know, so I think that that has to be understood. So wherever there's a high amount of emotional engagement, you will find swings in terms of expectations. People will expect the moon because mm -hmm. yes, stock is a hair. You know that sort of a thing. The third thing is that I think one of the things we should learn from the mutual fund industry is investor education. They spent a phenomenal amount of time, energy, and money. On managing expectations of investors, right. right? I think a similar thing now needs to be done in the alternates industry. You yeah. know, one or two basis points by key players. If you start devoting towards, uh, I'm not saying educating because this is too smart a segment to be educated, mm -hmm. but highlighting the virtues of PMS and managing expectations. I think it will be very good. Just to conclude your question in terms of performance, mm -hmm. I think the last three or four years, uh, last two three years in particular, have been very choppy. Typically, if you see. Uh, when the world comes out of a global crisis, you know you talk about 2000, you talk about 2008. I'm just giving you some recent markers. Mm -hmm. uh, now 2020, uh, there is a rush of money which comes in, uh, which lifts all stocks. So typically, you will find a lot of stocks which have hitherto not done too well, which will do very well. Mm -hmm. And quality stocks, you know, stocks which command a premium, which have good modes, which have good cash flows, uh, very well respected companies, they tend to just uh, not rise as fast as compared to the rest of the uh, fraternity, which is why you see returns starting to compress, returns starting to underperform mm -hmm. the benchmark. But again, if you look at the same data, you'll find that seven, eight, ten years after that, there is a flight towards quality. India is a growth oriented economy. There is a flight towards quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then polarization in terms of these stocks happen. They start commanding their premiums all over again. If you see in the last two, three years, this is exactly what has happened. Quality is now starting to make a comeback. People are now starting to look at is given to certain stocks vis-a-vis -vis earnings which are now starting to come in and they're now starting to rationalize. So my sense is the next three to five years, we will say complete about turn and quality will start attracting a lot more money. Right. Got it. Uh, my last question is a personal finance uh, sure. question. Uh, let's say if I have 10 lakh to invest today, what would be your recommendation? If you're 10 lakh, you cannot invest in alternatives for sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't you ask me a question if you have one crore? You okay. are in the new if, India. Why, why don't you become ambitious? Why ask for 10 lakhs? Let's talk about one crore, okay? Okay, uh, let's break down our uh, okay, one Let's crore. talk about 10 lakhs. Let's talk about 10 lakhs, okay? Uh, I think uh, equity as an asset class, for sure. Okay? Uh, so, you should be very clear about what your goal is and what your risk profile is. 10 lakhs for you and 10 lakhs for me will mean two different asset allocations. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, because of our age, because of our ability to, uh, you know, you would have probably got some loans on your head, you know, raising a family. I would have probably been past that stage. So I can afford to be a lot more in equity than you do, correct? But I would highly recommend that considering the growth opportunities, at least 50% of your money, if not more, mm -hmm. uh, should be in equity, whatever equity. You can invest through direct equity, mutual funds, the way you want to look at it. Uh, I would personally want to believe that uh, real estate will do very well. Uh, not that you can buy real estate through 10 lakhs. Uh, but you know, in case you want to take a loan and pay a certain amount of EMI uh, through real estate, I think that is a very decent asset class. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest could be in debt or gold. Uh, I'm not too, uh, I'm not too hung up on debt uh, as as an investment avenue or gold as an investment okay. avenue. So that is what it is. What would be the combined weightage of gold and debt? Let's say not more than 10, 15 percent. Not more than that. Again, it depends on your risk profile. Right. Yeah. Uh, somebody like me uh, would be very high on equity. Okay, I would probably be 70%, 75% on equity, uh, maybe a little bit on property, uh, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it is.